talk to you about the end of the world. A um, little bit off topic. So first of all, I will talk a little bit about the theme of the conference, which uh, uh, Mark has set as Pearl and the Internet of Things. So some of you will have probably been to various talks about the Internet of Things. But just in case you haven't, a one-slide summary, it's about connecting not just computers to the internet, but things, so objects. So here, for example, is a bubble machine that um, my co-author Abraham has created called Bubblino, who listens to Twitter, and every time his name is mentioned or a hashtag that he's interested in, he'll blow bubbles. So this is an example of the Internet of Things. But so, you might be asking, why did Mark decide that the theme of this conference was Pearl and the Internet of Things? And part of the reason is that there's quite a lot of hype around the Internet of Things at the moment. How much hype, you ask? Well, who better to ask than Gartner, the consultancy? They have the famous Gartner hype cycle. And can you spot the Internet of Things in that cycle? It's right there at the top! So that's a lot of hype. Um, but you might ask, why is there hype about connecting things to the internet now? Things, human manufactured <coughs> objects, have been around more than a million years. And the internet is coming on for, you know, 50 years or so. So, why are we talking about it in 2014? And part of the reason is that things have come down in price, as happens with technology. So, in the late 80s, when we were connecting to the internet, the kind of processor that could make an HTTP request, maybe do some encryption of HTTPS, Render HTML, maybe do JavaScript. Do we have JavaScript in the late 80s? I forget. Um, might have cost you the price of a, of a small car. And these days, you're looking at a chip that maybe costs you the price of a chocolate bar. That's not just quantitatively cheaper. That totally changes the rules about what you can put things into. I mean, you could put, you could have a bubble machine that costs you the price of a small car. But who's going to be interested in that? So, so that's one aspect. And another is actually size. So this is uh, Dr. Sue Black, computer scientist, who's been really um, involved in trying to make sure that Bletchley Park remains open to the public as a monument to computing. And she's standing in front of Colossus, one of the earliest computing, uh, uh, earliest programmable electronic computers. And Colossus can be embedded into a purpose-built building. That's not really convenient for, you know, embedding into anything else. Now you might not see there, she's holding in her hand a Raspberry Pi, that's much more the kind of uh, form factor that you can start talking about embedding things into the internet. So here's a more close-up view of another microcontroller board, the Arduino. And one of the things you can see there is the actual components on the Arduino only take up a small fraction of the surface. It's actually bigger than it needs to be in order to make it easier for hackers and prototypers and tinkerers to play with. Uh, which is quite interesting. <coughs> so, I got involved in hardware um, about three or four years ago when I moved into an office and co-worked the space and make a space with a bunch of uh, uh, crazy hardware hackers. And one of the things that first amused me was that occasionally there'd be an email going around the office going, hey guys, I'm doing a final order. Does anyone want to get some components because we can get a good deal on them? And to me, these components do the kind of things that us as software developers kind of take for granted. They're like, uh, it's as if I would send an order going, hey, does anybody want to join me? <laughs> we have a good deal on if statements or for loops. <laughs> and so there is definitely a gap between software, which is totally malleable, and hardware, which is physical and rooted in the real world. And that's quite an important thing. So there's also a gap in the difference in the amount of hype between the two topics of uh, this conference. So the Internet of Things on the one hand and Pearl. So the Internet of Things is right there at the top of the peak of inflated expectations. And let's look down the trough of disillusionment. Do we see Pearl? No, we've got over that. Do we see it on the slope of enlightenment? Well, the Enlightened Pearl organisation and other things have maybe taken us up past that. They are the plateau of productivity. Surely, Pearl, as a productive language, that's where we are. Less charitable people would say that we're way over there in the sea of tranquility somewhere. But, you know, that's what they say. To the extent that the organisers of Yapsi North America this year had this one of their uh, official t shirts. And of course, the joke is Yapsi wasn't cancelled, neither was Yapsi Europe, nor a whole host of workshops and hack hackathons and so on. And these things take a lot of organisation. So thank you very much to Mark for organising this fantastic conference.
having all the volunteers involved, that's a lot of people, a lot of time. Uh, you guys coming to attend, all the speakers, sponsors who, are, who have spent money on making sure that this happens. This kind of stuff doesn't happen accidentally. It doesn't happen when there's no demand for conferences. So that, I think, gives you an idea that there is some life still within Pearl. Um, on the other hand, uh, as Davis pointed out, when did you last read a book about, let's say, big data or parallel programming that had examples in Perl? It was your book, actually. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, so I had the opportunity to co-author a book with Adrian, and one of the things that I took out of that opportunity was the chance to have some Perl examples in the chapter on web programming. Um, but we don't often get chance to go outside of the echo chamber and speak to people who aren't involved principally in Perl. Is it an echo chamber? Or is it, as Sawyer suggested in Sophia this year, an anechoic chamber where those spikes basically kind of uh, totally quash all of the noise within the room and stop it from getting out? I have another theory about why to us Perl seems so vibrant and to the outside world it doesn't. I think it's because the Pearl community is bigger than the <laughs> So I'm going to come back to the TARDIS later. Um, I don't like to talk about it, but I do a lot of work for charity. Um, so over this summer, when I was talking to friends and family about Yapsi Europe and the organisational effort involved and all the people who were giving their free time, I was explaining it. It's a little bit like working for charity. And then I thought, Okay, so, you know, look at us developers, we tend to work in nice, comfortable offices that are warm and we get fed enough to eat well and, you know, drink well uh, and, and buy shiny toys. It's a little bit of a first world problem uh, as a topic for charity. <laughs> but I do think it does, have a, it does have a purpose, despite saying that. And so if you look at uh, open source, and the effort that it takes to develop Perl and software in Perl. There are people who are writing code, reviewing code, noticing bugs and reporting them, discussing. Uh, and there's people on all kinds of social media channels like IRC, Stack Overflow, and so on, helping people understand how to solve problems. And so this is actually contributing to the sum of human knowledge, which is just absolutely a good thing in itself. But there's also other schemes which are more recognisably charity. So you have Send a Newbie that Mark and others uh, run, um, and the No Outreach Project. Um, and through these programmes, we've brought people into the community from, yes, also relatively privileged uh, places such as the Netherlands and Germany, but also uh, India and uh, Thailand. So this is Obasara, uh, who was at uh, Sofia. Uh, this year. She was one of the alumni of the No Outreach Project and she's there talking about work she did on structured exceptions in Moose. So that's a real meaty piece of work uh, that we have brought in to the Pearl community uh, and it turns out that casting our net wider and being more inclusive um, of uh, a diverse range of people makes our community stronger. Who knew? Um, <laughs> And I think that's especially important because if you look at uh, the number of women in computer science, uh, this was rising along with all the other professions like law and medicine up until around the mid-80s and suddenly kind of just tails off. And this is a huge kind of social problem. And if you think this year with things like Gamergate and um, kind of troll mobs which are actually actively trying to discourage the participation of women in computing, this is an actual social and political problem that I think we as a community can help uh, address. So I say politics in the same kind of paragraph as charity absolutely advisedly. This is the uh, former Minister for Charities who suggested that char charities shouldn't get involved in politics, they should stick to knitting. Now, in the kind of same world that I wish I lived in, he would have been kicked out for saying something so moronic. As it happened, he didn't have to leave until he was involved in a sexing scandal. It couldn't have happened to a nice chap. <laughs> but, I will take uh, Brooks and Newmark's advice and uh, talk about knitting. <laughs> so, uh, this is my bear. Uh, over the last year, I knitted the scarf for him. It was quite an interesting experience. And I think he looks quite dapper, don't you? I do have to talk to him about his drinking. Uh, so, 
it turns out that just as in programming, there are a whole load of subcultures within knitting. So we might think of it as being a kind of quite uh, old-fashioned working class pursuit, like your grandmother or your great-grandmother might have uh, been involved in. And why would your grandmother have knitted? And part of it is that it was a cheap way to clothe your family, make sure that they're warm and comfortable. So nowadays we might not need to do it, but in an age of austerity and consumerism, it's also an actual social point, possibly even a political point. But there's also another more indulgent, consumerist, bourgeois side of knitting. So this yarn here from Vicuña, Vicuña is the national animal of Peru. It's uh, an endangered species, it only lives in the wild, and it can only be shorn every three years. That ball of wool will set you back about a hundred quid. Uh, it's apparently really lovely. Um, if anybody wants to buy me Vicuña socks, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, send them my way. Um, and there's also other kind of political activism. This is yarn bombing, where you make a statement by covering bits of public infrastructure in wool. I think it's very pretty, and it will totally smash the patriarchy. Um, but there are other more traditional ways of uh, raising money or awareness through knitting. So you might knit something <coughs> and sell it to, to raise funds for a charity, or you might knit blankets for the orphans of Afghanistan. And this is all really genuinely worthwhile. So slightly more related to technology, this is a Liverpool-based artist called Sam Meach, who makes uh, digital works using knitting machines. Uh, and uh, Aidan was telling me earlier that uh, he's um, presented a scarf to Tim Berners-Lee based, uh, based on open data. So kind of interesting stuff at uh, the, the joining point of uh, technology and knitting. Uh, and this is a frankly terrifying, but also quite amazing robot called Adnus that some of you may have seen at uh, Maker Faire this year and last year. Um, really impressive work. So, while I was learning knitting, I discovered I was quite bad at it. But it's okay, because it's actually quite like software, you can usually fix mistakes that you've, that you've done. And uh, this is something that I noticed, that once, one way to fix mistakes is to unravel the whole thing to a point before the mistake occurred, <laughs> and then carry on knitting okay after that. Does that sound too little bit like git rebasing a <laughs> few So this is a handy flowchart for Git, not for knitting. Knitters don't do flowcharts um, of uh, ways to solve problems in, in Git. And this pleases me because it actually looks a little bit like a knitting pattern because it's uh, sort of finely, finely interlaced. So I realise I've spoken to you a lot about knitting at a Perl conference, so I'm going to get back to talking about Python. <laughs> <laughs> So this was a controversial blog post, but quite interesting, uh, asking, is Python 3 killing Python? Um, and it has some questions that maybe relate, or maybe not, to our own community. And the questions are, uh, well, two of the questions that he made, is, well, Python 3 doesn't really have anything to offer over Python 2, and so why bother? And as a result, nobody has bothered, or sort of not enough people have bothered to give it a a actual traction. And the second uh, accusation was that um, development focus had totally stopped on Python 2, and therefore Python 2 is being killed and should be fought. So I'm going to come back to those in a second and ask whether those have any bearing at all on the relationship between Perl 5 and Perl 6. First of all, I wanted to point out another thing, that uh, this blog post is on medium.com, which is a rather attractive, more <coughs> Perl blocking platform. Uh, non Perl problem platform. Wouldn't it be nice if we had something similar in Perl? And the good news is that uh, from the summer, Amazon in, in Romania uh, released their platform called Trubsy, which is totally worth checking out. It is in beta at the moment, and they're really responsive, and you should all uh, set up an account and play with it to help make it become totally awesome. So, those two questions. Um, and um, uh, Jonathan and Liz talked about uh, Perl 6 uh, in Sophia, and actually, in terms of differences from Perl 5 and reasons that you might want to move to Perl 6, they are there. Uh, I'm not going to go into them, uh, but the things that particularly interested me were the really powerful um, constructs for parallelism and uh, really interesting stuff. You should uh, check out these uh, the presentations. And what about the impact it's had on Perl 5? So, it is true 
though I don't know with correlation or causation. But after the, you can't see that very well, um, after the announcement of Pearl 6, Pearl 5 did seem to stagnate for quite a while. Um, so, again, that may be correlation rather than causation. Since 2008, and certainly since about 2010, 2011, that's totally been reversed. So we've had as many, we've had five releases, um, 512, 514, 16, 18, 20, in the time that it took to get from 5.8 to 5.10. So if Pearl 6, even if Pearl 6 had any impact at all on Pearl 5 development, we've totally gone over that, and that's fantastic news. So, to the extent that people are now asking about the future of Pearl 5, which is, which is fantastic news, what do we want it to look like in five or ten years? But why not ask what do we want it to look like in a hundred years? So, Paul Graham has a famous uh, uh, article called The Hundred Year Language, and he asks, what, what is the future like for programming? Uh, he does mention Pearl, not necessarily in a complimentary way, uh, but he does say that it could evolve into something, and God knows what, in a hundred years. So I thought it'd be really interesting to find out what Pearl will evolve into in, in, in the future. So the best way to understand the future is to look at the past. Some of you may remember that in 2010 the theme of the Yapsi conference in Pisa was the Renaissance of Pearl. And for that, I did a bit of research into the Renaissance, <coughs> and uh, this was a painting uh, by the, uh, about the death of Leonardo da Vinci. And as I was looking into it, I discovered this shadowy figure uh, in the background was actually one of the organisers. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing stuff. And this character there on the right is in fact Michele, who's here today uh, at LPW. Amazing stuff. How did that happen? Um, I asked them about this, and they said, well, you know, it's really hard work organising a conference. And we were also doing some research into the Renaissance, and as we looked through Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, we found uh, <laughs> schematics for a time machine. So, you know, isn't technology wonderful? Um, but I also discovered this shadowy figure in the background, and it's Larry Wall. <laughs> Larry Wall it does not have a time machine. But, as David Conway has pointed out, you look at photos of Larry from the 70s, 80s, 90s, he looks exactly the same. He is, in fact, immortal. And he was there at the death of uh, Leonardo. So, we jumped into our time machine and flew 100 years into the future to see what was going on. And it turns out, well, you know, Larry's still there, obviously, being immortal. Uh, he is worshipped as a god. That's actually a shrine to, to Larry in one of the houses of the true believers. Um, Pearl 6 is still being actively developed. He will be out by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Matt Trout was also there. But Matt Trout does not have a time machine. Matt Trout is not immortal. So what was he doing there? It turns out he has been cloned. <laughs> Again, isn't the technology amazing? But, um, there are a few problems in 2114. It turns out there's been serious flooding due to global warming. Global warming was true. Who knew? <laughs> um, and I took a couple of photos of this. So as I was there, uh, clone Matt Trout said, Hey guys, well volunteered. You guys have got a time machine. You go back into the past and sort this all out. So, you know, Matt tells you to do something. So we had a look at how will we rewrite history. So, <laughs> there's 2014, there's flooded 2114, and there's the mistake we made. Damn our folly. So all we have to do is to go back, branch off into a parallel universe, tell you guys about how to solve all the problems, replay all the bits that don't include that mistake, and we're totally sorted. So this is great news. Um, but there are a few problems. <coughs> and this is to do with the gap between hardware and software, reality and uh, fantasy, I suppose. Um, in Git, you would simply <coughs> garbage collect this uh, future that we don't want and it goes away. Uh, but in the real world, that doesn't happen, so cloned Matt Trout from the future is still there uh, up to his neck in water. So that's not good. And the other problem is, well, so we avoided the floods. What about the other apocalypse that was waiting around the corner? And there's a lot of them. Some of them that we cause, some of them that, uh, that just, you know, happen because universe. So, there's a whole load of different parallel universes 
parallel options of the future, and uh, obviously we want to be in that one. And then the maths revolve, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be bad news. But so, this is a tech conference, and it's about solutions. And am I seriously coming here to tell you that the solution to avoid the apocalypse is just, hey guys, don't forget, be in the right universe at the right time. <laughs> um, so, as geeks and technical people, we are into measurement. Um, after the Fukushima disaster in Japan, it turned out that the Japanese government had very few sensors, and they weren't necessarily trusted to give accurate, non-biased information to people. So a whole load of geeks got together, uh, built homemade Geiger counters, and crowdsourced that information uh, onto the internet. And you can have, you know, even quite poor, badly calibrated Geiger counters, and it turns out you can still get useful information out of it. So, on a global scale, where global means Europe and North America, apparently, air quality is trying to do a similar thing uh, with air quality. But, there's two problems again. And the first of them is that not all of the problems were about physical things that we could control. They're about human things, like let's not have a dystopia, let's not have a nuclear war. And the second is that even if we can spot what we should do to avoid flooding, we still have to convince uh, things like governments and global corporations to make the right decisions. So, um, at Sophia, I talked about civic hacking. And I work for a company called My Society, uh, a, a charitable organisation, and we do a couple of things. Uh, and this one's quite relevant, perhaps, to trying to make sure that our government do not lead us into apocalypse. They work for you, allows you to monitor what your MP or uh, Lord is doing, and um, get in contact with them, find out what they've spoken about, how they've voted, and that kind of thing. It's a good way of monitoring them. Now, they work for you is not written in Perl, uh, but it does have an API. So uh, Dave Gross has uh, scraped that and various other things uh, in the political web. It's quite an interesting um, spin-off and mashup. Um, we do have a piece of software called Fix My Script, which is written in Perl, and this allows you to report things like graffiti and potholes and dump mattresses. And why am I telling you about that when I was talking to you about apocalypse and trying to persuade the government to do things? Uh, and the reason, of course, is that most people never, ever think about talking to power, talking to their government, and trying to influence them in any way. So the first time that you voluntarily decide you go and speak to your council because there's a pothole, may be the first time you've ever done that. And if you do that and you have a positive success, then that's good news. So. We as hackers can make a difference, and on behalf of these adorable squirrels, thank you very much for helping to save the apocalypse. Prevent <laughs>